What if politics weren't to blame for the institutional corruption, the endless wars and the burgeoning homelessness? What if rather these are all just symptoms born out of an outdated social structure? That's the revolutionary idea behind the explosive Zeitgeist documentary trilogy. Since the first movie's release in 2007, these documentaries have been translated into 40 different languages and have been seen by hundreds of millions of people around the world. But the ideas brought forward by the documentaries quickly transcended film and spawned the Zeitgeist Movement, a global sustainability advocacy organization that's revolutionizing the way people think and act. And now, the filmmaker will be re-energizing the movement with a yet another series titled Inner Reflections. Here to talk about the culture and decline, the Zeitgeist Movement, and where there may be a glimmer of hope, I'm joined by the filmmaker himself, Peter Joseph. Peter, thanks so much for coming on. Well, it's my pleasure, Abby. Thank you for having me. First of all, I just wanted to say that I think that these movies should be essential viewing for everyone on the planet because you really present these concepts that are much, not so much new or revolutionary as they are just glaringly obvious truths in the way that you articulate them, Peter. But I wanted to get into how you got all started. I mean, as someone who had worked in Wall Street and advertising, when did you step back and analyze your own role in society and decide to radically change course? Uh, great question. It was, a, it was a slow evolution, really. I, like many people brought up in this culture, you end up with a self-interest driven mechanism. I came from a middle class family. We had no real wealth. And I came into the world. I went to school. I dropped out due to debt problems, of course, like many do today in the educational uh, college career problem that we have, which, you know, most college debt is the peak of bankruptcy coupled with medical debts in, in aggregate. And I began to realize that there's something going on with the system. I moved and did stuff with Wall Street and advertising again, trying to keep my self-preservation going. And finally it dawned on me when I made this catharsis film in 2007 called Zeitgeist, just called Zeitgeist, excuse me, which became Zeitgeist the movie. And it was a frustration piece that I made when I it just sort of exploded in my mind almost to the extent that I don't even know where it came from, to be perfectly frank with you. It was a big catharsis that I did, which I threw up online. It became viral because I think people identified with the same issues and themes, and then that triggered basically where I am today, and I continue to move forward with representative media that is both entertaining and, and uh, value shifting in the quality that it pursues, but also extremely educational and ultimately activist oriented, and that's the whole purpose of my existence at this point. Nice. Thanks for explaining that. So, so let's get right into this. With the elections coming up in less than two weeks, let's talk about the two-party system, which you explore a little bit in a recent video that you made called What Democracy? What purpose does this system serve to control the population? I mean, do you advocate people to completely remove themselves from the electoral process, or do you see some merit in supporting third-party candidates and local politics? I think we have to deal with what we have at the moment. You know, people should be supporting referendums because that's a form of direct, direct democracy. But the aristocracy game that's emerged, which is an outgrowth of basically the economic system, which, in, which inherently generates hierarchy, this is completely misunderstood. We think that we're in a different paradigm today than we were during the age of kings and queens, but we're really not. Except the kings and queens are behind the scenes and they operate within the business industrial enterprise, which is, of course, the driving mechanism mechanism of all values and institutions we have. So the figureheads, you know, the elections, the presidents, the Congress, they serve as tools, for lack of a better expression, to perpetuate the real driver of our economic system, which is the monetary market economy itself. And those values that are there confuse people. And they think that when they go into a voting booth and elect somebody, that they're going to actually change something. But if you look at the historical record, which unfortunately many have not, especially since the beginning of America, very little change has occurred really when it comes to the election of any single individual or the conglomerate actions of the Congress or whatever parliament institution, what have you. And this statistical element is lost, unfortunately. I'm not, this isn't projection to say that, oh, it's just to be cynical, say it doesn't matter if you vote. This is proven. Right. So the effect of these elections is not given the correct gravity because it's very small. I'd say maybe 10% is how effective the election of a new president really may be. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and then it also serves to disempower and disillusion people into thinking that they do have a choice. And then, of course, every four years, nothing changes. And it really is stifling humanity in that sense. Uh, when people look at the current trajectory of the world, it's obvious that we're pretty much on a crash, crash course based on a model of unsustainable growth, Peter. I mean, when people look at global capitalism, some argue that, you know, it's not a free and fair market. If cronyism were removed from the equation, capitalism would work. But I mean, is the two-tiered Justin that we're seeing today? Today, the plutocratic governance and endless war for resources, 
an inevitability of the capitalist model. Unfortunately, I would have to declare that it is. And I know it's a heated subject and people love to argue with me. I have an endless debate on people that say the state is the problem or regulation and that the market should just be free to do whatever it wants. And I argue back that the market is as free as it ever was. In fact, it's more free, I would say. There, at least in the past, were restrictions on the market economy and how it could influence the aristocracy's decision to basically rule everything through war. And, and again, the things that nothing has changed in this regard. You go back to a few and you have the same tendency. But the idea that there's something that can be regulated on a system that's inherently corrupt in my view, a system that clearly says that you can get money, have the freedom of money to do whatever you want with it, hence the Supreme Court decision that says that money, spending money for political campaigns is actually equated to free speech. Now this, this delusion that we've come up with to say that we can spend money for whatever purpose possible and influence anything is at the core of the vast corruption we see. And it's, you can go back to Marx, you can go back to Thorsten Veblen, you can go back to all sorts of thinkers in the early 20th century that despite their criticisms, uh, you, they they were on to something with this and it's unfortunate how fast people are to shut down this idea so you know my friend Lee Camp has a famous joke uh, we applaud politicians now that come and tell us that they're not going to give us health insurance in America